All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Dylan Agnes. I work for the Integrated Design Lab. Uh, and today, I will be presenting on daylighting multipliers, uh, increasing daylight harvesting efficiency. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, really, some people will still be filtering in, um, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So the IDL uh, is a nonprofit where it's dedicated to research and development of high performance uh, buildings in the Intermountain West. Uh, we currently have seven employees. Uh, this lecture, uh, as is a couple of our programs that we offer, uh, is sponsored by the Idaho Power Company. Uh, normally, we I would be giving you lunch while presenting this, but uh, due to COVID-19, I apologize. We're not doing any in-person operations at this time. Uh, but most of our stuff is available. Uh, our services are available online through Zoom or a uh, phone conference. Uh, so one of those is technical design assistance. Uh, it's broken down into three phases, uh, uh, separated by uh, scope of work. Um, so the more work there is, the higher the cost. Um, so if you would like more information or to get in touch with us about that, please visit our website. Uh, we also have the Building Simulation Users Group. Uh, Ryan Swartz from Cushing Terrell uh, just recently presented on utilizing Grasshopper and Ladybug for early design. Uh, for September, uh, it's still happening on the 23rd. Uh, however, we were not able to find a speaker uh, for Power of Ethernet, IoT, and microgrid potential. Uh, so I will be presenting on using the daylighting and solar um, analysis of Insight, uh, Revit's uh, Insight program. So and, uh, details for that will be coming out later this week if you are um, subscribed to these. Uh, lastly, we have our energy resource library. Uh, we have over 900 uh, diagnostic tools uh, for identifying uh, problematic uh, mechanical equipment or uh, control strategies uh, in buildings. Or if you just want to test something out or uh, diagnose a problem, uh, please visit our website to find out more about that. Uh, we do have a contact list uh, pick up and drop off system for the tools. And here are some other uh, commercial and industrial energy free stream programs by Idaho Power. Uh, please visit idahopower.com slash business for more details. And with that, we can get into the lecture. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, when to daylight, uh, how to daylight, measuring light. There's a couple of different uh, methodologies used. Uh, as well as evaluating light, doing a cost-benefit analysis, uh, and then touching the sun, uh, kind of a metaphor for simulation programs and methodologies. So when's the daylight? Uh, daylighting is the controlled, emphasis on controlled, admission of natural light, sunlight, into a building for the purpose of illuminating a space. Daylight harvesting is the controlled, admission of natural light, sunlight into a building for the purpose of reducing electrical lighting and energy, um, i.e. kilowatt hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so this is a diagram uh, I use when talking about uh, energy modeling, um, when, to, when it's most impactful. Uh, and so in the design process, and so it's kind of broken up into two parts. The, the first um, top row being uh, when you're making uh, decisions for design, in the bottom half, you're generally uh, just producing documents. You're not really deciding anything anymore. Uh, but when it comes to daylight, uh, the, the most impactful, in my opinion, is the pre-design and the schematic design phase. And so in the pre-design phase, uh, we're going to be looking at the building characteristics, uh, form, shape, orientation, uh, glazing, i.e. the window-to-wall ratio. Uh, as well as site, uh, context, climate weather data. And then in the schematic phase, we're going to be uh, looking at what daylighting strategies, um, and we're going to be pulling from the pre-design all that data and analysis we've done to inform us on what daylighting strategies we should be doing. And if there is one in particular we want to do, how we can kind of make it work, um, as well as then control strategies, um, whether it be in glazing, shading, light shells, 
site contacts, i.e. trees or other buildings, uh, as well as sensors. So for the site, uh, we're going to start with uh, context, climate, and weather data. So it's important to understand your site as it will provide you with data to help you get started. Um, most people, when, I, when I'm talking to them about daylighting on a project, they don't know where to start. And so the best place to start, in my opinion, is just start collecting data. Um, so for example, uh, what strategies, if any, are the surrounding buildings using? So your site's there. Uh, sorry, I forgot the people. Uh, your site's there, but um, you know, note the orientation and width of other buildings. Uh, possible to conduct a survey or a study of the surrounding buildings. Um, and you know, me being building scientists, I have no qualms, you know, going up to people and just asking them, uh, hey, what do you like about the space? What's wrong with it? Are you comfortable? Is there glare? Uh, things of that nature. Uh, but also, uh, your buildings should take advantage of the sun path. Um, it's relative to the latitude and longitude. However, other site conditions such as circulation, wind, or obstructions uh, should not be disregarded. So daylighting, as much as I would like to put it at the top of the totem pole and most important, uh, it, it's not. So don't let it be the end-all be-all for um, decisions. Uh, so starting off with uh, getting, collecting that data, uh, I like to use a site called WeatherSpark. Um, it's just uh, kind of a, it's free um, and it's just kind of a collection of data uh, from weather stations around the country uh, and it's presented in a um, you can get the hard data where you know it's just the tables and uh, the files but uh, the visual the visualization of the data I found is very helpful uh, explaining to clients uh, so you're going to get kind of a summary uh, but what we're interested in for daylighting is the first uh, portion of this which is uh, about the sky and so with the sky uh, it's going to give you your sunrise and uh, sunset uh, with daylight um, savings accounted for. Uh, and so this is how much um, potential daylighting hours uh, you have um, for your site or um, your, the city where your site is located. And it will actually break it down and give you uh, how many hours are, in a, uh, are available in a given month on a given day. Um, and it will draw this trend line for you. And so you can see when you want to be maximizing your daylighting and when uh, you're going to have least available. Uh, the other thing that's really important is uh, weather data uh, involving uh, just, uh, the sky, so uh, clouds in particular, um, so overcast versus clear. Uh, so you'll notice in, um, in June, we have a really, really big uptick in the availability of uh, sunlight because it's just clear. Uh, and so you can see there's a gradual drop off, not as immediate as, as we are gaining it, and it levels out. So you basically from the middle of June to kind of the end of September is when you're going to get the most bang for your buck uh, if you're implementing daylight strategies in Boise. Uh, and so like I said, uh, it's basically taking the, the data from a file, putting it into a table, and then visualizing it further by giving you this graph. Uh, and I kind of want, I would like to show you um, that real quick. Uh, so here's that summary. Uh, so we're gonna click on it and I'll just drop you down the page to where, where it's located. And you can click on, so like say we were interested in the month of June because there's such a gradual uptick. So we're gonna do that. It's gonna give you the entire month of June from here to here, the 30th as well as the next month and the previous month. And it's gonna give you all the averages of the month of June. And if you wanted to go even further and say, we're gonna look at the 8th of June, it's gonna give you the averages for that day in particular. Now you don't necessarily uh, need to go this in depth. Um, I'll do it when I'm doing a, a lead certification and they're not doing the standard um, certification where they want to, instead of doing, you know, 365, nine to five throughout the entire day of the year, uh, that lets you pick an individual day and then an additional day, uh, depending on the original day you took, et cetera, based off a table. Uh, so that's where that's helpful using and trying to get, um, you know, the, the bright day so they'll, they can meet certification. 
uh, but there's that option. So, uh, fun fact, the first weather report was forecasted on August 1st, 1861. It was by Robert Fitzroy, who's a vice admiral in the Royal Navy. Uh, he created what we now know as weather stations, uh, and he collected data uh, via Morse code in real time. So there's kind of an image of those initial ones and giving you an idea of what we have today is these are all the weather stations. There's actually more depending on the color. There's multiple weather stations, but we have quite a bit of data we're collecting on weather. So moving onward, uh, building characteristics. So the orientation, form, shape, window to wall ratio, as well as the type of glazing are the other things you want to focus on in the pre-design. Um, so I know you you all know uh, this diagram. Uh, so it's from Sun, uh, wind, solar. Uh, this one, this one. Sometimes I yeah, Sun, wind, and light. Sorry, it was slip of the tongue. Uh, sun path diagram. Uh, so what this does is it's going to take your average kind of ballpark data from the city and narrow it down to your site specifically. Um, it's this is kind of a non-digital version of it. However, if you don't want to do um, the legwork for this, uh, there are other uh, methods for doing it. Uh, the University of Oregon, uh, this is for Boise, Idaho, uh, will let you input your latitude and longitude uh, specifically for a site um, and will create this sunpath diagram for you. Uh, as well as there's uh, options in Insight uh, to do that as well, as well as um, a solar analysis for uh, photovoltaic um, potential and rate of return. So building characteristics, uh, form and shape is really important. Um, form will affect the type of strategy you choose, while shape will determine the effectiveness of that strategy. Uh, so for example, if you choose an atrium, uh, are you going to have that, you know, as a pitch eave, uh, your glazing, or is it going to be flat connected? Uh, are these levels going to step back and be recessed so that more daylight can fall down um, to the ground? Uh, things like that, uh, as well as, uh, you know, reflective lines. If you have a pretty big window to wall area ratio, uh, you don't have any shading. Reflective lines is a really good way uh, to mitigate um, the heat gain coefficient, uh, as well as, you know, refracting light um, for even illumination um, in a space. Um, the thing you want to do is you want to optimize the building's footprint for daylighting. Uh, you do that you, by you want to maximize your exposure on the south and north facade. Uh, the reason why the south just gets the most uh, sun and north um, gets the most uh, even um, distribution of, of light, uh, while limiting exposure on the east and west. Uh, the reason for that is you're going to have some um, harsh angles in the morning and the evening. Uh, so there's a lot of potential for glare and so a heat gain. Um, so in that you'll have to offset uh, those loads somehow if you're not uh, doing shading or orienting your building properly. Uh, the other thing is to determine the correct ceiling, uh, whether you want open, drop down, or inclined. Uh, really don't see a lot of inclined. Uh, and that's mostly just uh, economics. Um, it's just you have to change a lot of standard fittings and a lot of uh, cookie cutter templates um, for installing HVAC and lighting and, and other things. Um, so the cost benefit doesn't really balance out. Um, drop down uh, is what you're typically going to see. And then open, um, while it does allow more daylight, um, I've seen a, uh, recently more open ceilings that will have, um, I don't want to say random uh, panels. Uh, because they're not random, but they're for sound, um, for mitigating sound and vibration and echo. Um, however, those can interfere with daylighting. Uh, so now I'm going to take you on to another tool we have. Oops, that's not the right one, that one. Um, which is on our website. Um, so if you go to Services, Design Tools, and you click on Daylighting Pattern Guide. Uh, I'm going to get this and hit Launch. And so uh, this is what I'm talking about, optimizing the building's footprint. Uh, and this is also a good tool um, for uh, visualizing and uh, explaining, uh, excuse me, the idea to a client. Uh, 
And so this is a free tool um, you can use. Uh, and it basically breaks it down. Let's go to this different one. So here's your typical, you know, uh, mid-rise, high-rise uh, floor plate design, you know, just column grid by grid. Uh, and so 55% of the floor area is above 300 lux on a sunny day. So pretty good. Uh, not, not great. But then if you go to that cloudy day, only 25% of the floor area is about 300 lux. And so that's where uh, uh, using that data we previously talked about from WeatherSpark or other other sites, uh, you can determine you know how effective your your daylight strategy is going to be on a clear day versus cloudy day, and what you can do to increase that. And one of those is uh, building form. Um, so for example, this one, 100% of floor area is above 300 less on a sunny day. And then when you go to a cloudy day, 90% of the floor area is still above 300 lux. So only a 10% drop. And then I'm just going to run through. So then um, uh, the other thing um, is the interior programming of the space. Uh, so this um, pattern shows you uh, workstations and how effective uh, they are. Uh, so with just no furniture, no anything on a clear day, it is 75% uh, of the floor area is about 300 lux. And then we start adding some furniture. Okay, we're still at 75%. And then we start adding uh, some height to it, so closing off some things, still at 75%, so that's, that's pretty good. And then we start adding some partitions, now at 65. Now we start adding additional uh, glazing and dividers, 60%, more partitions, 45%, increasing the partitions, 35 So you get what I'm going with this. And then uh, if we have, you know, the typical 72-inch panel height, we're at 25% of the area is above 300 lux. And say we just added clear glazing uh, to a lot of those panels, that only gives us a 5% increase. Um, so the interior programming of the space is also important. Um, for the efficiency of your daylighting strategy, as well as getting, if you're going for daylight harvesting, uh, increasing your rate of return. And the last panel I want to, or guide I want to show you on this, is the glazing area. Because uh, typically the first um, question I get uh, from someone about daylighting is, well, can we just increase the glazing area? Uh, and so it's that uh, same space with 10% glazing, 0%. 15, 35% uh, is daylit, 45%. So it does have an effect, but eventually it does it does fall off. And then there is a cost associated with increasing uh, the glazing to one to wall ratio. So uh, generally I found it's more effective and more economical to try to optimize the efficiency of your current glazing or, or strategies rather than just trying to brute force it. And that's a full uh, floor to ceiling height is 95%. And so uh, of this pattern, or uh, uh, this this guy, there are 19 patterns uh, you can choose from uh, to kind of demonstrate um, different strategies uh, or control methodologies, or just explaining uh, <clears throat> excuse me, why um, daylight is increasing or dropping off depending on a strategy or arrangement of of the of the space. Uh, and one thing note before I move on from that is the window to wall area ratio. Uh, that's more of an important uh, factor because uh, it impacts the heating and cooling loads, your daylighting, uh, potential for ventilation, uh, views, and then cost. So uh, considering on glazing, uh, uh, two factors you want to consider, um, visible light transmission or VLT. Uh, it's the amount of light uh, in the visual portion of the spectrum that passes through a glazing material, uh, as well as uh, solar heat gain coefficient. It's the fraction of solar radiation emitted through a glazing material that is either transmitted directly or absorbed to be then radiated over time. Uh, and so it's kind of displayed in uh, two different types. It's either as a percentage or a factor. Um, so VLT 
uh, is expressed as a percentage, and you see VT uh, is just a decimal form of the percentage. Um, so VT of uh, 0.67 would allow 67 transmission, uh, transmission of light. The reason why we have those two um, different factors is uh, decimals are easier to work with in equations than percentages. Uh, so the solar heat gain cofactor, uh, or sorry, coefficient, uh, uh, you want to take a look at the E-factor, the thermal bridging, as well as the heating and cooling loads impact. Uh, and so that's kind of tied um, to the uh, visual uh, light transmission. So the higher, generally the better your uh, solar heat gain coefficient is, the worse your visual light transmission is. Um, so you want to try to find that compromise and uh, balance it out. Uh, to get, you know, the best of both worlds. Uh, there is another uh, unit of measurement that's not commonly used. Uh, it's, it's SLG, which is that ratio between solar heat gain coefficient and VT. Uh, it provides a gauge of relative uh, efficiency for different glass or glazing types. Um, uh, the energy performance rating isn't always provided. The reason for that being is it's kind of a variable. Uh, it really depends on kind of where you're installing it uh, in the climate. Um, so it's kind of hard to nail down uh, that ratio. So we can do all the math we want, but until we actually install it and collect the data, we won't actually know how effective that is. Um, so one program you can use for looking at a multitude of features uh, for glazing is Windows 7.7, .7, or the current version is 7.7. .7. Uh, and no, it's I'm not talking about Microsoft. There's actually uh, developed by uh, LBNL, uh, National Laboratory. Um, and a majority of manufacturers uh, put their data onto this, uh, why is it, onto this program, uh, just because they kind of would like you, there it is. Uh, they would like you to pick their product for, for your project. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, and so what it's going to do is you can uh, go window shopping, so to speak, or you can build your own window uh, if you would like. Uh, that's, that's useful for if you're doing a simulation and you want to, you're trying to recreate something um, that's already constructed and it's, you know, it's old enough or unique enough that it doesn't generally fit in the, the standards. Uh, so you're going to get a name ID, and it's going to tell you, uh, you know, thickness, um, uh, the visual resolution, you know, solar gain, uh, emission if it's uh, treated, um, everything like that. And there's, uh, let me bring it back up so here. So there's, there's quite a bit. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options uh, you can choose from. Uh, are there any questions uh, at this point on anything I've talked about? Um, feel free to throw them in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay, then. Uh, just press on. Uh, so measuring light. Uh, there are two units uh, used. You can kind of think of it, uh, one as US customary and one as metric. Uh, the metric one being lux. Uh, one lux is the amount of light from the same source at one meter. Uh, you'll typically see that value used in uh, lead B4. The other unit of measurement is foot candles. Uh, it's a unit of measurement for code compliance. Uh, one foot away is equal to one foot candela or one lumen per square foot. Uh, you'll see in IEC uh, 2015, or uh, IES on um, their um, recommended foot candles um, per space or uh, space type. And so two of the ways we interpret that unit of measurement is uh, spatial daylight autonomy or SDA is the percentage of a space that can meet daylight uh, most of the time. And so the way that's written is SDA 300 slash 50 at 55% is saying that at least 55% of the area is illuminated to 300 lux for at least 50% of the time. So 
Uh, and so depending on what unit or standard you're going for, uh, this will change. But generally, 50% of the time is kind of uh, uniform across the board. Uh, the other way you interpret it is annual sunlight exposure, or ASE. Uh, ASE is the percentage of the space that receives too much illumination resulting in glare. Uh, so it's written as ASE 1000 um, slash 250 at 13%. And what that means is that uh, it's saying is uh, no more than 13% of the space receives more than 1000 lux for more than 250 hours per year. Uh, and generally, based on the standard, uh, you, you want a high SDA and a low ASE, but they're very linked. Um, so, you know, generally when you're increasing your SDA, you're going to be increasing your ASE. And the way you offset that is through control strategies, um, such as, you know, shading, lines, light shelves, um, exterior shadings, um, louvers, et cetera. Uh, another one is useful daylight factor and illuminance. UDI is the percentage of time when useful daylight is available. Um, so that's an estimate. Uh, if you see that uh, for like a city or um, your site or an area that you're you're working with, um, it's basically someone's taken uh, the cloud data, the weather data, uh, and factored in uh, when um, the percentage over the year of how how many days where there's useful daylighting available. Uh, and DGP uh, is an index, or I'm sorry, daylight glare probability uh, is an index that is used to measure glare from daylight. Uh, it's an index that considers vertical illumination at the eye level. Um, so this is kind of a, still an open uh, for debate on where the min and max and you know the the, the range uh, is. Eventually, uh, it's daylighting building scientists who would like to get um, a graph similar to, you know, the ASHRAE standard for uh, comfortability in a space. Um, we're not there yet, um, mostly just because uh, uh, there's a lot of data that still need, uh, needs to be collected, but also there's just a wide range of, you know, some people are okay working at a desk where the sun is in their face. Uh, some people prefer to work in a cave uh, and they say, yeah, there's enough light. <laughs> uh, so it's just a wide range. Uh, so it's kind of hard to narrow down um, the average recommended. Uh, daylight factor uh, is the ratio of indoor to outdoor illuminance, uh, typically used for analyzing light uh, uniformity. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, uh, they have a listing in their handbook uh, for recommendations on uh, space type and what they recommend uh, for foot candles. Uh, so I would just recommend Googling IES foot candle recommendations and generally some manufacturer uh, has interpreted that or just copied it and presented it as their own PDF uh, for recommendations to use with their products. So evaluating light. Uh, this is from CBEX uh, 2012. Uh, and this is just giving you uh, a range of what lighting control strategies are used. Uh, and um, you'll see that typically the daylighting uh, strategies are more heavily used um, in larger buildings. The reason why that is because there's a, a high variability of return uh, and you're generally going to get more return over a larger area than you would have a smaller building. Uh, so speaking of that return, uh, daylight is kind of broken down into two categories. Uh, we have the energy benefits and we have the non-energy benefits. So energy benefits being a measurable difference that can be calculated and used uh, to project savings for a cost benefit analysis. So kilowatt hour reduction, reduction of maintenance, uh, data analysis for trends. So refining the system, making it more efficient over time. Uh, non-energy benefits uh, is the unit of measurement still being debated. Um, so productivity, um, you know, people, we, we like it when there's natural daylight, air, you know, we're, we're human. Uh, so we're more productive that way. Uh, as well as, you know, with all of the screens that we have um, today uh, in our lives, uh, it helps, you know, regulate our sleep cycle, the melatonin, um, as well as, you know, just overall wellness, you know, kind of just eliminating 
uh, unnecessary stress um, and hardship, you know, on someone working. Uh, so, you know, that can result in a reduction of sick days, you know, as well as, you know, higher productivity. So, but that's still up for debate um, as far as getting hard numbers for. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, from Lutron, uh, their lighting manufacturer. I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, and you'll notice that on their rate of return on the right-hand side, there's no singular percentage. It's always a range. And the reason for that is, uh, is all those variables we've, we've talked about so far, um, you know, location, climate data, orientation, window to wall ratio, glazing type. There's a lot of things that go, in, that go into how effective daylight can be for your building. Um, and so depending on how much you invested in that will determine, you know, how much you'll save. Um, other factors, you know, uh, such as, uh, you know, just your utility company, their cost, um, that they're charging per kilowatt, as well as, you know, their non-peak hours. Um, so, you know, that's high-end term and tuning, uh, turning lights off and on uh, when not, not being used. Um, and then daylight harvesting, uh, 25 to 60%. It really just depends on uh, everything I mentioned earlier. Um, but then a lot of this uh, layering on top of the, you know, the initial daylight harvesting um, helps reduce um, your kilowatt hours over the years, so it can help you know make that uh, that case to a client. Um, so presenting um, them individually, and then as well as you know layering them and showing them how effective it is for integrating these strategies, you know, across the building or just in a particular space where you're interested in doing it, and how it can increase your rate of return. Uh, so what that looks like visually. Uh, so here's a graph. Uh, basically the energy used if you just left the light on um, and had no no occupancy or vacancy sensors and then eventually you know in the day hopefully someone puts the light off or starts flipping lights off and you know then it goes off and you, know, you have your emergency egress lights or security lights that stay on and eventually at some point those will go off too and then start all over and so what this green line is is the reduction of kilowatt um, hours used uh, through, you know, last movement triggered. So occupancy sensor senses that 10 minutes later, shuts off the lights, or you have uh, dimming capabilities, or there's um, that the occupants keeps themselves, or your daylight harvesting. Uh, so there's enough light available. Um, so we're dimming the lights and bringing down the load. And so this is what you're trying to capture with all those uh, control strategies, as well as just allowing daylight into the building in the first place. And so that kind of looks different, um, or I shouldn't say it looks different. It's interpreted differently depending on who you ask. Now, if you ask uh, IECC, what they're going to tell you uh, the daylight zone is, is this red line, this outline. So if any lights you have in here that have a photo control sensor and are dimming in response to daylight harvesting, you're going to get credit for. However, Say you've designed the facade and you've implemented a couple strategies and your daylight stretching to where the blue zone is. You're not going to get credit for that. Even though you can measure it and you can refine it based off the current uh, understanding of the code, you only get credit for that. Now the green outline uh, is what lead interprets it as. So if your space type falls under the type that it needs to be daylit, either occupied or non-regularly occupied, uh, it wants, it's going to take into account the full area. And then, so say you daylit um, to all the way to where the blue zone is, you're going to get credit for that percentage. You're not going to get credit for the other percentage of it though. And so, so basically, you know, all this back here, that's not really getting any daylight, that's counting against you. Um, so you really want to try to do even uh, daylighting illumination across the space if it's considered uh, for lead. Uh, the new 4.1 version allows you to make exemptions um, for it uh, to move some spaces from occupied to the non regular occupied category. Um, and so here's kind of what, how you determine the daylight harvesting area according to IEC 2015. 
Uh, so you're gonna take the um, the height of the window from you know the floor to the top sill, and then extend that into the space. So that's your your length, and then your width uh, is gonna be determined two feet in either direction, unless you hit an obstruction and it's less. Uh, and so that's the area you're gonna get credit for for daylight harvesting. Uh, and then there's roof uh, penetration assembly uh, and rooftop monitoring is kind of the main three uh, they break it down into. Um, sorry, this is a silent zone, which is basically just your windows. Uh, and this is for IEC uh, 2015. Uh, in 2015, uh, you're actually required um, to put in photo controls um, for a particular um, spaces. Uh, and then if those spaces are side lit, have a roof penetration assembly or rooftop monitor providing daylight, uh, you are required to put in uh, photo control um, sensors for that space. Uh, and then uh, for 2018, which is going to be adopted, I believe next year, uh, even more spaces are included in that requirement. Uh, so talking about, or uh, moving on now to shading. Uh, so from the glazing, we talked about glazing, how to treat it and uh, what that can do. Uh, one of the strategies you can do is shading. Uh, so either vertical or horizontal, uh, solid or perforated. And one thing you really need to consider is the angle of incident. Uh, and so, Basically, that is uh, the sun angle uh, from winter to summer. So generally, uh, when you're planning your shading, you're trying to block the summer sun, but allow the winter sun to come in. Uh, and so that's a impact on your heating and cooling loads. That can either help you or hurt you, depending on um, what your loads are and what your strategy is or uh, what you're using the building for. Uh, and then that angle of incident, now that we plan for it, uh, the material type or finish uh, will determine whether we have a specular uh, reflection or a diffuse reflection. Uh, and so a diffuse reflection is you're probably used to seeing uh, it's like a frosted uh, finish on a window where it's just evenly uh, distributing uh, light after it's been refracted a couple times and you can't really see too through it, it's not transparent. Uh, specular reflection, you know, we're concentrating the light, we're controlling it um, to where we wanna go to bounce and reflect off uh, the, the ceiling uh, to kind of distribute. Uh, and so when you do uh, this type of strategy, the light shelf with the louver blinds, or that's not supposed to say light shelf, I'm sorry. That's supposed to say exterior um, shading. Uh, but if you uh, created the, you know, the right length and the right height for it, uh, then you know, it starts to become an exterior light shelf uh, for refracting a light in. Uh, but you do need to be careful about that angle or tilt that it's at, as well as you know the the finish, because if you uh, you could have glare uh, resulting from that. Uh, another thing is uh, site context. Uh, so say you don't want to do exterior um, shading um, for whatever reason, uh, the next best thing to do is trees. So uh, it's a passive uh, shading system for mitigating the summer sun while allowing exposure in the winter. Uh, and then, you know, the, the sun moves throughout the day. Uh, so, you know, if you're planning on the, the east or west facade, uh, you, you might need a different type of uh, vegetation to plan for that, uh, that sun angle or exposure. Um, okay. uh, additionally, uh, you know, there could already be a building there and it's providing shading, um, but also, you know, be careful, look at that building's uh, angle of incident um, from the sun to see whether or not you know it's going to refract light um, into your building or onto it and provide glare. Uh, another one is uh, car parking. You know, is the car uh, on street parking or the parking lot level or at the same plane as the first four you know windows? So there could be sun reflecting um, off of it either in the morning or the afternoon or the evening, and just you know creates glare in um, some spaces in your building. Um, and so, you know, that can be mitigated with you know, either reorienting the parking or just adding uh, some vegetation. Uh, so moving into the interior, uh, 
uh, for light shelves uh, to redirect uh, light to shift and increase uh, the daylight zone. Uh, so now even though, you know, I can prove um, that a light shelf, you know, an exterior um, shader with an interior light shelf can improve the overall daylight illumination in the space, it does not allow me to increase the daylight harvesting zone um, as recognized by code. Um, so unfortunately, that's not a thing, but you will see the actual reduction in kilowatt hours over time um, throughout the year by doing that. Um, but uh, when you do this, it separates the window into two parts. Um, so we're saying this is the view window. Uh, so, you know, we're going to allow the winter sun to come through, but the majority of the time, you know, in the fall and the spring, there's going to be some transition. But the majority of the time, there's not going to be a lot of daylight coming through uh, this bottom half of the window. We're going to focus it up here. And so this just becomes a view window. Um, and you can add blinds um, or a shading screen to it for, you know, that winter, that winter time or just uh, privacy. But, uh, yeah, then generally this becomes more effective um, and it increases, you know, your daylight harvesting uh, capabilities. Um, so going further uh, into glazing, uh, you want to look at uh, the, some things you can do is low E coating, uh, and that kind of plays with the, uh, the VLT to the solar heat gain coefficient ratio um, as it offers an increase in visual light transmission while maintaining a low solar heat gain coefficient. Uh, so getting the best of those both worlds, uh, depending on your window to wall area ratio, that could be expensive. Um, as well as looking at panes, uh, typically you're going to see uh, the diagram on the left, uh, double pane with insulation, uh, but you can go further than that if you, if you would like. Um, adding more panes, though, um, does mess with your angle of incident and how uh, light is going to be diffused into the space, so you have to plan for that. Um, that's just because it's passing through uh, more material planes, so it has greater chance of being affected and changed. Uh, and then sensors, uh, so on the right is uh, typically what you're going to see for a, a daylight harvesting uh, system. You have the fixture, you have the window for the source of, of daylight, uh, and then you have a photo control sensor, which is taking into account you know, either electric light and daylight, or one or the other, depending on how you have it set up. Uh, that sends that um, data to a controller, which then sends it to a dimming unit, which will then tell it the percentage of uh, how much it should dim uh, because of the amount of available daylight. Uh, and so typically the three main strategies you'll see is open, closed, or hybrid. Um, open, kind of being an oxymoron, uh, only takes into account um, uh, illumination in the interior, uh, whereas closed will take into account uh, exterior, and hybrid is kind of a, a play on both where you have multiple sensors or you have a sensor with a different um, uh, angle, uh, then to, so it's a more wide um, angle of incidence that it's re um, reading light, so that it can take into account both. Uh, strategies are getting uh, more advanced uh, in the way that uh, we have luminary level lighting controls now. Uh, and so what that does is it takes this system, all this, and it puts it into the fixture. So, and you can additionally have more sensors embedded into the light. Um, so, you know, infrared, uh, we have the light sensor, uh, status indicator, motion sensor, uh, you know, receiving signals, sending signals, upgrading uh, the, tech, uh, the software, patching it, um, and more. Uh, like you can actually have a thermal camera embedded in, into your light as well, or uh, say in a, a router, um, and receiver, so for uh, Wi-Fi internet data. Uh, and so that's basically giving you, uh, as the name says, uh, control on the luminary level, so per fixture. Uh, and so that's kind of going for a more of an integrated design approach um, where, you know, you're collecting the data, you're feeding it back to uh, maybe a building automation system that can uh, make adjustments in real time or, you know, at the end of the day or at a certain, you know, update point that you set based off the data collected. 
uh, and you know, so you can have a, a thermometer in there as well. So you you know, uh, get in the temperature range. Uh, you can get really sophisticated uh, if you create a you know a portal for your occupants to use in the building. Uh, it's where you know they can give you a report of comfort. Uh, you know, when it's bright, uh, it's too hot, it's too cold. You know, things like that. Uh, and it's also a way um, to fine tune um, your building uh, strategies as well as you know identifying trends to help uh, validate that rate of return uh, as well as uh, additional recommendations so that you can get further savings. Uh, and so that's kind of what control systems uh, will do for you. Um, you're going to get some form of rate of return, uh, whether you know it's a basic control system like just uh, a lighting operation hours. Uh, you know, turn all the lights off at you know 10 p.m. because no one should be in the building at 10 p.m. You know, leaving the security lights and whatnot whatnot on. Um, to you know having uh, you know, building automation system, making adjustments in real time from data collected. It just depends on the investment, uh, what level of the project is, and what the rate of return you're looking for. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about some of the programs that are used in the industry. Uh, so Radiance, uh, Light Stanza, Honeybee, and Insight. Uh, I'm a big fan of Radiance. I use it. Uh, it's a suite of tools performing lighting simulations originally written by Greg Ward. Uh, it includes uh, rendering as well as many other tools for measuring simulated light levels. It uses ray tracing to perform all lighting calculations uh, accelerated by the use of the Octree data structure. Uh, it's a command line interface. There are no buttons, no drop down menus, um, nothing like that you would typically find uh, in a software program like uh, Revit or SketchUp or um, something of that nature. Uh, the reason why it was developed in the 70s and the 80s under government funding for just figuring out what we can do with computers. Um, so it does not require a 3D model, uh, but if you want to use one, the most common is SketchUp, and that's what I use. Um, if you would like to use uh, Radiance but not deal with uh, uh, the command line, uh, it's it's a high learning curve. Radiance is a really good daylighting program, but it has a very, very high learning curve. Uh, so if you don't want to do that, it's a company called Light Stanza. Um, they basically give you the buttons and the drop downs that you can use uh, from your SketchUp model uh, to basically run uh, lighting analysis, whether you know it's a massing form study or you wanted to produce documentation for your lead certification. Uh, they can, this program uh, they offer can help you. Uh, Radiance is free, Light Samza is not. Uh, and so if you're not using Radiance, uh, I would recommend uh, using Honeybee. Uh, it supports detailed daylighting. Uh, and it tends to be um, most relevant during mid and later stages of design. Uh, the reason why I recommend it is it's essentially a uh, user interface for Radiance. Uh, you do have to pay for it though. Um, but as far as, um, it, it gives you a lot of flexibility um, that was originally found in Radiance. So the good thing about Radiance being open source free, uh, not having drop downs or buttons is that it gives me the ability to create my own buttons, my own drop down menus, my own standards and features that I want to use or you know, libraries of materials and workflows, et cetera. Uh, Honeybee allows you to do that just, you know, through a user interface that you're more accustomed to. Um, and it uses Radiance as the engine, as well as uh, it's applicable for Energy Plus and Open Studio. Uh, so running energy analysis with your daylighting and lighting analysis. Um, so that's why I recommend it, uh, as well as you can import any data from uh, the Berkeley lab uh, CERM and window programs, uh, window being uh, this one I showed you earlier about window shopping. Uh, it accomplishes this by linking the simulation engines to CAD and visual scripting interfaces such as Grasshopper, Rhino, or Dynamo and Revit plugins. Uh, Insight uh, is Autodesk's uh, Utopia, where all geometric construction, simulation, and analysis takes place in one software program, uh, plugins are, are acceptable in this 
ideal. Uh, so typical energy modeling programs are often, uh, so this is, uh, in, this is why Autodesk made Insight, was they believe that typical energy modeling programs are often complex for architects to use during the early stages of design, resulting in building performance analysis being performed at later stages. Um, the architectural profession lacks established methodologies and protocols that incorporate performative analysis into uh, early stages of design. So Insight would like you um, to basically conduct energy simulation, daylighting analysis, you know, studies uh, earlier in your design process, which can be a little bit harder um, because the data is not always available or if it is available, it's kind of segregated into different phases of the design process, as well as different languages, depending on the software program that's used. Uh, and so Insight's trying to be a solution to that, to allow you to do all that in one model, one software program, um, which is Revit. Uh, and so uh, the left is kind of what um, Insight is trying to, the goals it would like to do. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to say uh, Ian Malloy, he's the product, um, he's a senior product manager at Autodesk. He's basically in charge of Insight. That's his baby. Uh, and he says, the point from day one is not to quantify the amount of energy, but rather provide the opportunity to enable a conversation with the architect, engineer, and client. So Insight isn't meant to be a one-to-one -one replacement for doing detailed energy analysis or um, daylight um, simulation. Rather, it's uh, meant to give you direction and um, accuracy. Uh, they, want, they want you to do it from concept to detail. Uh, they would like to have a conversation between the architect, the engineer, and when applicable, the client. Uh, one model to rule them all. And they would like you to do it on every project. Whereas the right is uh, typically um, how it's, the process is uh, that they view it as which is we need to know exactly where we are and we need to know the exact heading um, in which we're going. Uh, it's typically happening at the, uh, the detailed design process. So where you're producing documents, not making decisions. So it's pretty easy to know where we are and where we're going at that point. Uh, and you typically have a specialist or in-house engineer that does it and you kind of just uh, bring them in at that point when you need that verification. And so what they do is they typically do it in a separate model. You know, they're exporting it, they're taking the data out, they're interpreting it, they're getting rid of what, what's irrelevant and adding in what's relevant. Uh, and then it's generally only done on special projects where you're going for lead certification um, or the client has expressed, you know, an interest or, you know, a city has, or a utility company has incentivized, uh, you know, projects to be built in a certain way to a certain standard. Um, so you're trying to go for that. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, talk about my checklist, uh, which is kind of everything we've, we've talked about. Um, first thing I look at is uh, climate data to get an estimate, uh, some estimation of, you know, available daylight uh, and, you know, how effective is that daylight. So looking at the clear to the overcast, uh, what's that ratio? Um, Analyzing the site context, you know, um, are there other buildings um, there? Uh, you know, if it's a renovation, talking to the, the building occupants that are there, uh, what they like, what they don't like. Uh, I've generally found people will tell you everything they don't like about a building or a space and have very little to say about what they do like. Um, uh, and then, you know, taking all that data that I have and seeing how it's going to help or hurt the project based on design restrictions and constraints, and then you know what what are we what am I going to do to address that? Um, and then typically my baseline is uh, the lead before um, be updating that soon to uh, 4.1 as soon as I get more familiar with that. Uh, but the standards there are are, are pretty good, uh, uniform to kind of give you a baseline estimate on how your building's performing. Uh, and so you know I do that standard, and then I do additional simulations for the perimeter and or the daylight strategy areas. So where there's uh, daylight being applied explicitly, um, as well as then I do a simulation for each of the spaces. Uh, and so that kind of gives me um, levels of data so that I can see uh, how effective 
uh, a strategy is or certain spaces uh, performing and you know, why that is and explaining that uh, to the client. And then, you know, doing the what ifs, what if we increase the window to the wall area ratio? What if we uh, remove the interior partitions? Uh, you know, what if we added uh, clear stories or a skylight, you know, it's a secondary daylighting um, uh, strategy, uh, et cetera. And out of those, what if I'll, I'll make my recommendations based off of, you know, the design restrictions, constraints, as well as, you know, the um, economics of the rate of return um, or uh, how likely it is uh, to be implemented based on cost. Um, uh, yeah, so that's uh, generally what I do, uh, you know, and then I'll come back and do it all again from the uh, from the standard, uh, from the perimeter of daylight strategies to spaces and, you know, rinse and repeat until we get the finalized uh, results. And, you know, pub and publish those uh, for them to use. Uh, so that's that's all I got. Um, 